Let me tell you something. If there isn't a gay porn where a bunch of guys in tunics jerk off on a guy dressed like Julius Caesar while announcing that the Ides of March are come, well, there sure as hell should be. Here's a little something to make you folks come. A fresh episode of the Savage Sack Tap starts right now. You're listening to the Savage Sack Tap. It's not a podcast. It's not a half cast. It's just a quick shot to the balls to help you finish off the week. We're cutting through the bullshit, filling your Friday with rage-fueled logic, and cracking a few jokes along the way. So grab a bag of frozen peas. There's a savage sack tap coming your way. Smooth, lascivious, salacious, outrageous. And this is where I say hello to you fine folks, or should I say top o the morning, even though it's uh, almost 9 o'clock at night, 8.30, uh, after St. Patrick's Day. So our uh, pseudo-celebration of the Irish has uh, has thankfully come to an end. Uh, I did not... Didn't go out for St. Paddy's this year. My drinking has been way, way the fuck down. So I was not, uh, I was not in the mood to, uh, you know, crawl into a a fucking bar with a bunch of pasty, drunk Irishmen singing, whatever the fuck, I don't know what the fuck they do. The fucking Irish, they're all pale and red-faced and and what have you. Uh, So I had a very, uh, very low-key St. Pat's. I, I worked out. Um, I had a beer, I watched uh, South Park, the uh, Imagination Land, one of my absolute favorite South Parks, by the way, absolutely fucking hilarious, they got that big fruity fat guy, they're riding around in that airship, and then they're they're hanging out with all of the adorable creatures, and Al-Qaeda shows up and suicide bombs the place, it, it's just, it's fucking amazing, and I guess it, it kind of qualifies as a St. Patrick's Day episode, because Cartman is hunting for a leprechaun, and if he finds it, uh, Kyle has to suck his balls on camera. And it's just, it's just tremendous. It's one of the absolute best pieces of, of work that the South Park guys have ever put out. If you haven't seen Imagina- Imag- Imagination Land, that I would highly recommend that after you're, you're done consuming this dog shit that I'm about to spoon feed you, definitely check it out. Uh, I wanted to watch Homer versus the 18th Amendment, for Simpsons fans out there, that's the one when um, it starts with the St. Patrick's Day parade when uh, Bart has the, uh, it's like a Vuvuzela uh, up in the air and uh, they're spraying beer off of the duff truck and Bart drinks all of the fucking beer. He's like, open your yaps, boyos. Um, and so they, they enact uh, prohibition in Springfield and Homer becomes a, a bootlegger and he's uh, on the run from... Uh, from a, uh, what were they, uh, what were they called? Prohibition agents? Is that what they were? Uh, the Prokeys? If I remember correctly from, uh, Boardwalk Empire, Rex Banner. Uh, but yeah, am- amazing, amazing Simpsons episode. Arguably, I would say, if you're a Simpsons fan, you have to at least put it in the conversation for, uh, for best Simpsons episode ever. There's the, uh, the one where they get all the Major League Baseball players to play on the, uh, the Springfield Power Plant team. That's uh, that's a strong contender. What else? Maybe the one where they uh, where they all join the Navy. That one fucking ruled. But um, for me, I I think it's hard for me to find one that I think is better than uh, Homer versus the Eighteenth uh, Amendment. I always get along with Simpsons fans. If someone is a fan of the Simpsons, they're probably reasonably easy to get along with. They they tend to be a nerdier bunch. Um, but they are uh, they they are very agreeable people. They have senses of humor because you have to you have to have kind of a brain to be a Simpsons fan, especially after like the the earliest episodes. You could probably be like, oh yeah, Homer's gonna say dough and and chug some duff. But the deeper they got into it, and the more they got into just off the rails, fuck it, like political references and and shit like that, and, and digging deep into uh, different corners of pop culture to to pull stuff out, it became like. It's still hilarious, but a much, much smarter show. So what I'm essentially what I'm doing is I'm patting my own back, and I'm sucking my own dick, and I'm telling you guys that uh, not only do I have a great sense of humor, but I'm incredibly smart uh, as well. Um, I hope I'm smart enough to have uh, said that I am Mike Montone, and this is the Savage Sack Tap at the top of the show. I don't know if I did that. I don't know if I did the bare-bones job of appropriately welcoming you to and naming 
the, the show that you're you're consuming right now. There's a, a distinct possibility that I did not, and then uh, my claims to be uh, intelligent would be proven false. I would be proven to be uh, an absent-minded dope. Anyway, Seinfeld fans too. I think Seinfeld fans are an easy, very easy to get along with. They're at least. And I mean Seinfeld fans, not just people who, you know, they watched when it was on or whatever, or they caught an episode now. I mean people who fucking love Seinfeld, that you can rip a line in front of them, and they'll know the line that preceded it, the line that followed it, the entire plot of the uh, the episode. They, they don't mind. They'll turn the hat around backwards, and they'll be like, Hunky, Tony! And they know exactly what you're, uh, what you're talking about. Um, Seinfeld fans, very easy to get along with. Curb, always sunny. Nathan for you. If I find out that someone was a fan of Nathan for you, then I automatically like them. You, the a fucking hilarious, underrated show that not enough people watched. John Benjamin has a van. That's another, if you know about, if you're a John Benjamin has a van fan, give us a little shout in the comments. And I am still a family guy watcher. I know a lot of, most people gave up on Family Guy probably about 15 years ago or so, maybe more, possibly 20. Um, I fucking love Family Guy. Uh, Sopranos, amazing show, but a lot of douchebags like The Sopranos because douchebags do universally love anything that is mafia or gangster related uh, it has cocaine and tits and stuff like that now a lot of wonderful cool people like those things but again l lots of uh lots of fucking douche canoes um are are in fact sopranos fans just because it's such a like tony soprano is just a, such a universal badass and so many complete jackasses like to think of themselves as as like badass tough guys that they, it, there's a little there's a little bleed through, unfortunately, but yeah, I'll, I'm I'm going to cease droning on and on about TV shows because what do you want to talk about a fucking TV show for? You want to watch a TV show? We have other stuff to get to today, um, and we'll start off with a brand that is near and dear to my own heart, Barstool Sports. Where's the uh, logo? There it is. Viva La Stool, Sack Tap. Uh, I'm a huge Barstool fan. I, I don't. They've expanded, and some of their content's gotten a little, a little watered down for my taste. I realize they're trying to appeal to women, and, and that they're like a, you know, they're a big company now, so they can't get away with some of the shit that they, they used to. But the old reputation that they have, and again, they still have some great stuff. Like fucking Jim Florentine's got a podcast with them. That guy's. That guy's fucking hilarious. Uh, Kirk Minahane's very funny. They got a whole veterans thing going. Uh, Prez is one of the funniest motherfuckers on the play. Pre his his cockiness and arrogance and the way he just loves... Like, he spent 20 years building this thing and he is just waving his dick in everybody's face who tries to, like, shame him over his behavior and sense of humor. I absolutely fucking love it. And that is actually what uh we're going to be getting into uh at this very moment because i don't know you know if you guys are active on twitter or not but there was a little spat on twitter between barstool and the wokenistas as we like to call them around here uh, led this time by a gentleman named gord miller and i guess this is a name that if you're a hockey fan means something i think he's a uh, He's on like TSN or something like that. I don't know. I don't know what that is. It's he's he's a hockey guy, and someone asked him on Twitter if he would be appearing on the Barstool Hockey Podcast, Spitting Chicklets. Again, I'm not a huge NHL guy. I, hockey's a very cool sport. It's just you know you only have time for so much. And after I graduated high school, they put the fucking Devils on the Outdoor Life Network. They made it impossible. They made it difficult to watch hockey. And then it, it just faded from, you know, my, my fucking view. So, apropos of, of absolutely nothing, uh, here's this tweet that he sends out. He says, My comment today about not wanting to associate with Barstool Sports has prompted a lot of text, emails, and calls. The response has been incredibly positive, especially from female 
BIPOC. Uh, BIPOC is, um, I believe it's black, indigenous, people of color, colleagues who have been afraid to speak out about their issues with Barstool and sites like it. Um, first of all, nobody, nobody has ever been afraid to speak out against the likes of Barstool Sports. It is literally, if you are a a journalist and you want to, especially a sports journalist, and you want to score huge points with blue checkmark Twitter, all you have to do is, you know, write a, a quick little post bashing Barstool and grab, you know, whatever, whatever their latest joke that you can take out of context is, slap that in there, spread it around Twitter, and you will absolutely get your kudos from the, the Wokenista crowd. Uh, I just have, and to show you how frequently it happens, because it's about, I would say, on about a quarterly basis for the past few years, some, you know, again, either, it's, I almost feel like it's kind of like the Mafia, where um, to, uh, to get in, they're always like, you, you got to whack somebody to get into the mafia. Like, they're not going to let you in unless they know, one, you got a little blood on your hand, so it makes it harder for you to fucking snitch. And two, that if they're letting you into the mafia, they would like to know that you are capable of doing the, the stuff required of being uh, a, a top-performing mob guy, which might mean, uh, you know, putting, uh, putting some fellas in cement shoes, as it were. Uh, and so it seems like, to me, that to kind of earn your, uh, your Wokenista, woke left sports journalist uh, bona fides, the easiest way that people see to do that is to write something shitting on either Portnoy or Barstool Sports. Uh, so some of these, uh, these headlines... Barstool Sports founder unapologetic about using racist language in comedy videos. Inside Barstool Sports culture of online hate. Barstool Sports easily spreads, promotes problematic ideologies. Ooh. Barstool employee quits over Dave Portnoy's racism. Uh, what else do we have? Barstool Sports and the persistence of traditional masculinity. Right, like it's a bad thing, right? The persistence of... Of, of traditional masculinity. <clears throat> I fucking love how they pose that as an automatic bad thing. Let me tell you something. We're fucking... This country is fucking hemorrhaging masculinity. Sorry, I was uh, a little cheebed up before. My, my throat's a tad dry as a result. So I don't want to keep coughing into the microphone. Um, this country is growing a bigger fucking set of tits and a deeper vagina by the day. We could use all of the traditional or toxic or whatever fucking masculinity we want to call it. Our fucking nuts are shrinking. Literally. Like, American uh, male testosterone levels are, are dipping as our sperm counts. We are becoming fucking pussies. Uh, what else? What's the next headline? I got it. Barstool Sports and Dave Portnoy double down on racism. Mm-hmm. I see. And these are headlines, these aren't from, like, you know, some guy's Medium page, or what was that, uh, oh, what was that one, uh, that they used to use, was it Tumblr? Might have been Tumblr, where they would blog, and there were also a lot of people sharing a lot of nude pics on there. I used to go there, I used to go there for, uh, for amateur nudes, but, um, yeah, these are from the, the Daily News, the Daily Beast, Variety, New York Mag. Uh, these are not, you know, when you're... When hit pieces in some of the most widely uh, circulated online platforms on the entire internet are, are going after you, these aren't exactly hushed whispers behind a, a locked door with the, the lights out and the curtains drawn, okay? These are regular, full frontal attacks by mainstream media platforms. So this idea that anyone is afraid to go after barstool is complete bullshit it is they are in, they intentionally frame it like that because these people thrive on perceived victimhood uh as we will see with uh gord i want to reiterate reiterate this gentleman's name in case you want gord miller it is a hockey name i'll give him that um the last name is not a great hockey name like, it should be, like, Messier or Kovalchuk or Brodor or something like that. But it's a good... Gord is a good hockey name. Unfortunately, this guy seems like a pussy. 
if I if I don't know anything about this and I'm not a hockey historian, if I had to guess, old Gord here hasn't hasn't laced up the skates since like elementary school, maybe. Uh, probably probably wasn't knocking a lot of teeth out uh, during during brawls on the ice. He writes, my problem with Barstool is the history of unapologetic misogyny, racism, xenophobia, and the repeated condoning of non-consensual sex. By the way, he, he there's a very soft way of, of accusing Barstool of condoning rape. Uh, if not wanting to associate with that makes me a part of cancel culture or constitutes virtue signaling or being woke, I'm okay with that. Uh, uh, and this is, this is where he really, really, if you, if you didn't think he was a douchebag yet, this is where he really spills just his cup runneth over with douche. As a public service, here are some alternative definitions of those terms, which are often used slash misused in the public sphere. And he goes on to educate us about the terms cancel culture, virtue signaling, and woke. Very nice of him. Cancel culture. Holding individuals and groups responsible for what they say and do. Which, no, it isn't at all. This is the bullshit thing that if someone says that there's cancel culture or that someone was unfairly um, canceled, that people always fire back. It's about accountability. It's not. That is just a very convenient way for them to say, well, look, if you don't agree with the way we're all piling on and trying to destroy this re this person's reputation, then you don't believe in people being held accountable for the awful things that they said. What they usually leave out is uh, the context of of the comment, often uh, a, a joke, uh, you know, a comment that made a joke or a comedy sketch or a, a joking tweet. Um, if you go out of your way to destroy someone for that, uh, or, or get them kicked off of their TV show, or deplatformed, or whatever, then you are, that is cancel culture. It's not accountability. When, uh, when I've, if people are going to hear this, they're going to be bored to tears. They'll be like, look, you fucking asshole. We've heard you say this a million times. Well, there are people who don't seem to uh, grasp this concept that uh, a small minority of people targeting a, a media platform, threatening their advertisers, and demanding that someone be fired, which, and this is, it's just, it's happened so many fucking, so many times. The the first, the most famous one was uh, Justine Sacco, right? She made that tweet, she was, uh, she was the chick that was flying to Africa a few years back, and she tweeted, like, flying to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, LOL, or whatever the fuck. Um, you know, and a fucking, it was a clear, a clear goof. Like, I'm sure she wasn't going over there like, all right, Africa, better make sure I don't have any unprotected sex because you could definitely catch AIDS pretty easily in Africa. Um, <clears throat> it's a very long flight from the U.S. to Africa and people caught the tweet and they, uh, sh they said they kept retweeting it at her employer and the hashtag has Justine landed yet was uh, was going going viral, right? This was really one of the uh, first major cancellations. Um, accountability is like Bill Cosby and Weinstein and you know Cuomo, if he really was rubbing his penis up on uh, women and looking down their shirts, as they say, that's being held accountable. Destroying someone over a comment or a joke, and now it's become en uh, quite en vogue. Uh, to do so, uh, they will, uh, they'll go back to when you were a teenager, because now people in the working world have had Twitter, you know, Twitter since like 2010 or whatever, uh, they'll go back and pull up your, your tweets from then, that was, you know, what, 11 years ago, so if you're 26, 11 years ago was when you were 15, you shot off a fucking, uh, a crass tweet when you were 15, you're going to 
be held accountable for it as a 26 year old doesn't make much sense to me and they don't put a lot of thought into this because these people are you know it's a very this is a very surface level thing right this is very superficial they're just grasping at whatever they can get a piece of they're not putting it into its proper context because these people are are unhinged uh the next one virtue signaling using one's public platform no matter how large or small to set an example for others and following through on that example in one's own life again no it's not it's uh virtue signaling is the hey guys look at me they everyone wants when any whenever anyone sends a fucking tweet out or makes a, a statement online what they want is the one of us, one of us, reaction um, from the right people. And more and more, they if they now, Twitter just boots your fucking account if, if you have the wrong opinion and, you know, every social media, pl I can't get a fucking, I can't promote a fucking video on Facebook because I say bad words. Um, but, no, it's, th like, this guy, Gord here, uh, it's great that a hockey announcer is such a fucking pussy, by the way, that he's wearing a mask in his Twitter pic. Like, I was looking for an example I could think of of virtue signaling, and there may be no better one than wearing a COVID mask in your social media profile picture. That's it. That is the virtue signal. It's amazing. Like, it's just it's staring us right in the face. He is explaining to us what he thinks virtue signaling is while not realizing that he himself is quite guilty of virtue signaling by wearing his stupid mask in his stupid dumb fucking twitter picture uh what's the next one woke recognizing that there has been and still is inequality and injustice around us and making a commitment to point it out and affect real change. Yes. I his this guy's fucking Mr. Sincere act is infuriating. Like I want to I want to bash this guy over the fucking head with a hockey stick. I hope I hope the next game he's doing someone cracks a fucking puck up into the broadcast booth and it catches him right between the fucking eyes so he can't tweet any of this inane drivel anymore. What a fucking jerk off. Um, but again, this guy is trying to wage a Twitter war against a comedy blog, right? And this is what everyone does when they, when they go after Barstool. They treat Barstool like they're fucking CNN or the New York Times or, or the fucking Associated Press. Like it's a platform that people should be getting serious content from. It's not. It is, it is outwardly. It is by its own own uh definition a smut blog they they're one of their bread and butter pieces of content is is smoke shows where it's just literally pictures of hot chicks they have porn stars coming on talking about squirting and doing fucking stepmother scenes uh it is you know they share viral videos of guys fucking getting hammered at during SantaCon and jumping across the subway tracks. You're not supposed to be going to the stool for, you know, legitimate guidance uh, on, on how to, you know, view a, a social issue or run your lives. They're joking about things. Like, everything that has ever been held against, like one of them, the uh, the condoning rape, which is the, the big one they go after Prez for. He made a joke uh, a, a judge had, there had been something used in court about uh, a rape victim wearing size 12 skinny jeans and Prez made the comment, I guess in a blog or something, well, if you wear size 12 skinny jeans, then I guess you deserve to get raped. And he was being very tongue in cheek. He was not in fact saying that if you are a little bit on the chubby side and decide to wear skinny jeans, that because of that choice in clothing, you deserve to be uh, violated uh, by so with someone's penis. It fascinates me. I mean, it would fascinate me if their if their stupid fucking motives weren't so weren't so clear. Okay.
Like, it, it just would... Like, if I thought that they were actually dumb enough to think that Prez was condoning rape, I'd be bewildered. But then you're just like, okay, so you're just lazy, you're looking for something to lash out at, and this is easy, right? This is much easier than traveling to a third world country to help fight female circumcision. Maybe that should be it. Maybe all of the, the woke jerk-offs on the internet who are worried about, you know, what kind of weight room they have for the women's NCAA tournament that nobody's gonna fucking watch. I, that was the big one on the news today. There's not a good enough weight room for the uh, the women's teams playing in the, the NCAA uh, women's basketball tournament. Nobody gives a fuck about the women's tournament because it sucks. I barely give a shit about the men's tournament, but if you if I had a couple hours to kill on, on Saturday, I might tune in for a game. There's no fucking chance I'm watching women's college basketball. They're terrible. I I could I haven't shot a fucking basketball since I don't know when Boardwalk wasn't open last summer, maybe the fucking summer before, playing some Boardwalk uh you know prize hoops, putting them up. Um Oh, you know, you know what? I think the the last time, yeah, I went on the Silkies hike in um, 2019 uh, with the veterans. We stopped at a fire uh, fire station in uh, Manhattan. The firefighters had a uh, basketball hoop up, and we were all passing the ball around. And I I chucked the rock up and uh, swish, nothing but net. So yeah, I could probably play in the fucking women's NCAA tournament and and dominate. I mean, if nothing else, as a a 35, soon to be 36 year old male, I'm reasonably certain that. I could compete with, or pr- actually probably out-compete most of those broads in most categories. Um, and again, this these are Division I athletes we're talking about here. Um, but in any case, uh, there is no... The, the people, uh, pe- people like this, I got off track there with uh, shitting on women's basketball because it's a, it, women's basketball is so terrible that it distracted me from the point that I was trying to make. And, uh, the point is, these people pick the easiest, they pick the biggest softball they can find, and they, they just wage a war about it, like they're leading the fucking abolitionist movement. Like, every one of these assholes thinks that they're, uh, they're fucking Frederick Douglass. Fucking Gord Douglass over here. Um, and he finished, uh, his next, well, he doesn't finish, he says a lot more, but his next one, and so no, I won't stick to sports or stay in my lane sports is a part of my life but not all of it and the road i'm on has many many lanes yeah i hope i hope you fucking run head on into a speeding semi and uh disintegrate into a a cloud of uh brains bones and blood fucking pain in the ass this guy reminds me of this pussy that i grew up with who used to uh he used to post pictures from the women's march he went to the, the, the women's march in fucking Washington and he wore like a, a, a pussycat hat. You ever see a guy seriously wearing one of those? Like not as a goof. Like I went as a male feminist for Halloween a couple years ago and I got one. I got the, it's, the hat is sitting around here uh, somewhere. But yeah, this is what this kind of, uh, this is what this kind of behavior is. I mean, this is, this is, he is the, the out loud version of a fucking simp. Like, you know when the, um, you can look at the sun, and if the internet is the sun, and it's just a big ball of fucking simps, uh, trying to do things to appease liberal women, um, what we have here, when something like this goes viral, is like when there's a solar flare, and just a big ball of fire, booms out of the fucking sun and we see it on a telescope and we're reminded that oh yeah the sun isn't just a yellow thing in the sky it's a big motherfucking ball of fire um so yes you have guys like this who are they just spend all their these simps if you're not familiar with the term these are guys who spend all of their time on the internet um sort of placating any woke uh topic they love the misogyny is a big one because these guys are, they're such pussy, they never get, they never get laid of their own volition. Again, these are the, um, the Mumford and Sons listening, uh, you know, dorm room date rapists, right? When the, when the chick is vomiting in a garbage can and crying because, uh, Chad from the lacrosse team 
fucked her best friend, you know, two days after uh, you, you, you gave him a blowjob. Guys like Gord here are the ones who swoop in and while they're holding, they're holding your hair back with one hand, but they're slipping their fingers under your skirt trying to, fu you know, finger your dry, drunk, crying pussy with the other. Like, these guys are the real fucking uh, pieces of shit. Maybe he's, maybe he's hoping, maybe he's fishing for a pegging. Maybe he's hoping that a powerful liberal woman with a, a bush that goes up to her belly button and uh, armpits hairier than mine will pop into his, his DMs with a poop-covered strap-on affixed to her waist uh, saying that uh, this could be you, but you tweetin'. And uh, maybe they'll, they'll get together for a, a, nice, a nice hot pegging sesh. That seems like what he might want. I can't say for sure. I would never say that that's a, certain, a certainty. But I can, I can certainly say that this kind of behavior would lead me to believe that if you were doing that, if you're a guy like that, you probably do want to get a, a strap-on thrust up your, your butthole by a woman from Brooklyn or Austin or San Francisco or uh, Portland or Seattle, wherever, wherever pegging is popular. Uh, he continues, If at Stool Presidente wants to point out where I lied about incidences of misogyny, racism, xenophobia, and condoning non-consensual sex. He, he won't say rape. He will not say condoning rape. And it blows my mind. Like, this is like when they call uh, the homeless are not homeless anymore. They're undomiciled. Uh, they were, for a while it was unhoused. But I guess unhoused they figured was too obviously close to homeless. So they went with undomiciled, which by the way still means homeless. If you do not have a domicile, you are without a home, you are homeless. Um, Non-consensual con non sex is rape. I don't know why he won't just say rape, but he won't. But uh, condoning non-consensual sex at Barstool, I'll be happy to retract what I said. However, I did do my research, and there is plenty of evidence to back me up in each case. Um, Sure. I mean, yeah, again, look, if you cherry pick pieces of content from the shitloads and shitloads that they have been putting out every day for over a decade now, yes, you can find things that Barstool uh, content people have done or said that could be put into the most absurd of lights. I mean, KFC was going to, to war with blind people and I think the entire nation of Honduras. So, you know, what's the... Do, is Barstool an anti-Honduras website? Like, is that where we're going to glean from it now? Or was it a bit? Was it a goof? Um, they have a female CEO. They have uh, they have a gay blocker. They have women all over their, their sports content. They have a female veteran who's giving birth right now. I mean, they have... Uh, they have everything. They used to, I did Barstool Idol. One of the guys I was up against who actually got a job there was fucking Mantis. He was all whatever the fuck he was. Mm -mm. Fucking, he was, you know, Stephen Hawking or whatever the fuck. Um, they do it, and someone could take that out of context. Say, oh, he's ableist. Uh, no, that's not, you know, we're, we're doing it. We're, this is entertainment here. We play it fast and loose with language, we fuck around, we throw things around, and you talk about uncomfortable topics in a casual manner because it disarms those topics and it gets a, a more honest uh, sort of response out of people and you can work through the, the tricky and sticky parts if you throw in uh, a little bit of humor. But yeah, so when you have a site that does that, you can certainly find things and you can dig and you can slice the, the comedic context away like you're doing surgery on a woke tumor uh, if you want to make your premise wor uh, work. And in fact, this guy did none of that, by the way. He just tweeted that he didn't want to work with them and called them these things without even providing reference to the fact that they are allegedly racist or condoning whatever his stupid fucking saying for, for rape is. Uh, he did not provide reference to the already often cited incidences that have been named before by others. So this guy is lazy as fuck. He just wanted the points without even doing the work. He didn't even write an article. He just did a fucking, uh, 
a tweet spree. And Prez invited him to debate, and he said no. Like, he was like, well, if you can tell me where I'm wrong, then I'll retract my statement. Okay, debate me. Well, I'm not going to do that. Ridiculous. Uh, my favorite statement of his. One thing that is indisputable is that Stuhl Presidente promotes aggressive online reprisals against those who disagree with him, as he did last night to at Vindog56, which led to responses like this one which was reported to Twitter by people who monitor my account. Yeah, he keeps claiming that he doesn't check his at mentions, which is bullshit. He says he has people who monitor his account. He has no one who monitors. He monitors his account. Um, yeah, I love it. Yeah, aggressive online reprisals. Do I need to go through, once again, the fucking laundry list of media outlets that have done hit pieces on Barstool Sports? HBO! Another one that attempted to. HBO, Real Sports with Brian Gumbel, tried to do it. Uh, big fucking platform. Um, you know, if Bar if you go after Barstool, and Prez has this guy, Vindog, that he has said, he puts comedic memes out. Uh, that's It's like a joke. It's a fucking goof that when someone goes after Barstool, they respond with ridiculous, childish memes. Um, you know... That and maybe some barstool follower, you know, at brofist69 calling you a fag in your mentions, you know, that is not, th there's no weaponization there, right? That's not an aggressive online reprisal. When the people who have the influence that the Daily News or fucking Gawker or Deadspin or whoever when they go after someone, as they often go after bar Barstool, I would call, I would call that an aggressive online reprisal, right? It sounds like he's afraid of getting a taste of his own medicine. It sounds like he got a droplet of his own medicine and realized that he had kicked a hornet's nest and, uh, and just completely lost his mind because he was tweeting about them all fucking day. He's nuts. And like paragraph... Multi-paragraph threads. If you're doing that on the internet, you're a fucking whack job. Um, yeah. Simp behavior at its finest. I don't know. Anyway, in conclusion, this guy is a huge fucking pussy. Uh, moving, moving on. What do we have next? The Donald. There he is. Yes. It is. It is time. I've been sitting on this one for... When did I find this? Last week, maybe? This, to me, is just the greatest Trump story ever told. And I think, I mean, the headline says it all. Trump reportedly showed people at a shiva photos of a naked woman on a yacht and called his CFO's Long Island house embarrassing. And uh, here, here's a little bit of the copy. Donald Trump showed people at a shiva photos of naked women, according to an attendee of the Jewish morning event. Jennifer Weisselberg, the former daughter-in-law of the Trump Organization's chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg, recounted the event in a New Yorker article published Friday. She said that it was the first time she met Trump before she married Barry Weisselberg in October 2004, and that it took place at the shiva at Alan Weisselberg's house in Wontalk a town on Long Island. Trump showed up in a limousine and blurted out, This is where my CFO lives? It's embarrassing. The New Yorker's Jane Mayer wrote, Then Jennifer recalled, Trump showed various Shiva attendees photographs of naked women with him on a yacht. The Donald, baby! Um, let me tell you something. Whether you, you hate him, well, if you love him, you probably love this story. But even if you hate him, you gotta love this fucking story. I don't know how true it is. Um, a shiva is, as they said, a Jewish mourning ceremony. And what happens is if a loved one dies, you sort of um, hold court in your home for, I believe it's a week. And uh, it's kind of like a wake, almost. It's like a wake, I think, after the uh, the burial uh, there's, you know, it's catered and people come and they offer their condolences and they, you know, they stand around, they talk about the guy. It's, it's been, you know, like a wake or like a, a week long repast. Um, 
almost, but it's, you know, which, again, yeah, a Jewish shiva, you can imagine, it's as exciting as that might be, probably a lot more fun when the Donald is involved, right? I mean, I would, I know, I would rather, if I had to go to a shiva, I would much rather look at pictures of naked chicks on a yacht, courtesy of Donald Trump, than stand around eating fucking, uh, you know, whitefish with uh, with Mabel, for, you know, 85-year-old Mabel from next door. She needs me to gra- help. She can't. She has trouble picking up the, the napkins because her, her finger, the arthritis, her fingers don't work so well. Uh, that sounds like it fucking sucks, if, if we're being honest. But the question I have is, it was 2004. How is he showing off these pictures, right? There weren't iPhones yet. Like, was he, he would have had to have been if this was the case. And maybe he pulled up in a limo. Maybe he just keeps pictures of fucking naked broads on a yacht in his limo. And he was thinking, look, this Shiva, it's going to suck. Uh, it's going to be boring as shit. I'm the Donald. People are expecting a lot out of me. They're going to want a performance. I can't leave the people hanging. I can't let them down. I better bring in some pictures. Everyone loves naked broads and yachts, right? Who doesn't? Everyone loves naked broads. Jews love money. Money buys you yachts. It buys you beautiful naked women. We'll have a little fun at this thing. You know, shake up the shiva, if you will. Um, But yeah, I mean, you know, you would... If that was now, and someone was like, yeah, he was scrolling through his phone, he showed me this chick's tits out on the high seas, it was great, I'd believe you. But 2000... I mean, she said she was married to the guy in 2004. So it means this would have happened prior to that very, very dubious story. I want to believe it because it's awesome and hilarious. Don't get me wrong. But if you start kind of peeling back the onion, it's like, hey, you know, what, what did, did he fucking, did he have just an envelope, like a Kodak envelope of, of printouts? Were they Polaroids? What's going on, right? Um, But if this did happen, I think Trump... Because then people are like, oh, he's bankrupt, he doesn't have money, he's going to need it, to, he might have to fight these legal cases. If you're Donald Trump, and you see all of these, you see these comedians are doing Zoom shows, or they do corporate gigs and what have you, and you hear about, you know, Hillary Clinton getting uh, paid shitloads of money to, to speak to, to Golden Sachs and all the, the bankers, you got to be thinking, you know... The New York area, Miami area, you know, what, what are the other Jewish uh, hotbeds in this country? You should be high, opening offices in all of these, uh, these areas to sort of advertise yourself and market yourself as a, a Shiva guest. You go, you show up, it's a little flat, everybody's a little... Uh, Everybody's a little sad, you know, we just buried Saul, he was a loving father, he was a great lawyer, we're gonna miss him. Um, Then you walk in, you know, you're talking about hanging out on yachts with these chicks with big tits, and people are like, really, that sounds great, and you say, well, I've got some photographs too, and you pull out pictures of chicks with big tits on a yacht, all of a sudden... Everything's lively. People are having a good time. Uh, you know, the, the shiva doesn't suck so bad anymore. Um, you know, maybe he, uh, like he, I guess he called the, uh, what, what did he call the guy's house? What did he say? He called it a dump or a shithole. Oh, he called it embarrassing. Yeah, like it would be great. Like he comes in and he roasts your family or, every, you know, whoever he sees um, at, at, at the Shiva, and I assume you could get this going to, you know, out, see, Gentiles would probably, uh, appreciate it, it goes to a couple, uh, a couple of wakes, I, I feel like the Irish would have fun with him, they're getting all boozed up, fucking laughing uproariously, he doesn't drink, but, uh, I feel like it would be fun to be drunk around Donald Trump, um, yeah, his, his family loved him, but he was broke, had very little hands, and was a huge pussy, uh, now would you like to see pictures of these women with huge breasts? That's my yacht. Those are their tits. It's wonderful. Uh, I'm sorry. I shouldn't be. I, I hate when people imitate Trump. Trump. I can't imitate Trump. It happens sometimes when we're referencing him. Um, I will lash myself later for that awful impersonation. 
But, yeah, the, uh, the article continues. Jennifer Weisselberg has spoken to prosecutors in the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, according to The New Yorker. She described Alan Weisselberg's life as revolving around Trump. His whole worth is, does Donald like me today? It's his whole life, his core being. He is obsessed. He has more feelings and adoration for Donald than for his wife, she told the magazine. She told the New Yorker that after sharing the naked photos at the Shiva, Trump began flirting with her. She said her soon-to-be father-in-law humored his boss. He didn't stand up for me, she told the New Yorker. A representative for Jennifer Weisselberg declined to comment. Representatives for Alan Weisselberg and Trump didn't immediately respond to a request for comment. Yeah, so this woman clearly has vindictive feelings for Trump. Although, again... I, there's this big part of me th that wants this story to be true. Because not only would he then be showing up commenting that the home where the, sh the morning event is being held is a, a fucking dump, but he's also armed with pictures of naked chicks on his yacht, and he's trying to fuck chicks at the Shiva. Like, this, I, the, all I need to know is that he double-dipped a fucking bagel chip into the ranch dip, and that would, that would solidify this as the greatest shiva in history. I mean, it's already the greatest shiva in history, but that would really put the icing on the, uh, on the cake. I mean, just absolutely fucking amazing. Uh, harder and harder to believe with each element we add to this. I'm still not sold on the pictures thing. Again pre-iPhone, he literally would have had to, like, what did you, you stop at Walgreens on the way, pick up your, uh, your color prints, and then you're so excited about them, that maybe that was it. Maybe it was the old days when you used to be so fucking pumped about picking up your, your developed photographs from that big event, you know, prom, or Halloween, or that party with chicks with big tits on your yacht, that... You just, you carry, you, you have, you just got them, you were looking at them in the limo, and you have to show someone, and you know that there are going to be, there's going to be a couple dozen people inside of uh, this little dump of a house on Long Island, and it's a shiva, so it's probably pretty fucking boring. So you figure you got a captive audience, uh, you, we'll, we'll look at, you know, we'll, we'll give our condolences, and then we'll spend a few minutes looking at, uh, looking at some tits. How could that hurt? You know? I mean, if I was, if I had died and you were like, yeah, so after they buried you, everyone was hanging out and Donald Trump showed up and he had a, a picture of a bunch of chicks with big tits on his yacht and he showed everyone, I'd be like, wow, what a way to go. People will remember that forever. Like you, your shiva, your burial, your death will be immortalized because Donald Trump showed up and was showing off uh, you know, pictures of naked chicks, which again, I don't know, I don't fucking, the wallet sized, does he carry around an album? I have no idea. Um, I hope it happened. It, it would be classic Trump if it did, but, uh, I, I remain dubious. What do we got next? Do, do, oh yes. Fantastic. Escape from New York. Things... <laughs> The new normal in New York City is just an absolute fucking train wreck. I mean, it has been... It was getting bad under de Blasio for a while, be honest. Like, there were just spates of, of guys going on, like, box cutter slashing sprees long before COVID hit and the homelessness shit and guys were smoking fucking spice and salvia and, you know, what have you and passing out in, in fountains up at uh, Lincoln Center and, and, and all that. So it's not like things were going well. Then the pandemic hit, and the city just turned into a complete fucking hellscape. We have here from the New York Post, woman stabs taser-wielding 14-year-old girl during argument in New York City subway station. Wonderful. Wonderful. Mm. A 14-year-old girl was stabbed in the chest by a young woman in a Brooklyn subway station Saturday night after the girl whipped out a taser during an argument. The incident began when the teen got into a heated exchange with the 18-year-old woman shortly after 6 p.m. in the stairwell of the number 3 Sutter Ave Rutland Road subway station in Brownsville. Oh, lovely place. If you're not from the New York area, Brownsville 
is a renowned uh, shithole. Um, police say the woman responded by whipping out a knife and stabbing the girl in the chest. It's a, well, I mean, I guess it is kind of a proportional response. The woman fled the scene with about eight to ten people, according to cops. I mean, I fucking love it. We are living through Escape from New York. Like, th this is it. It is Escape from... Like, I've been talking... You know, I was crossing the, the street across from the Port Authority one day, and some guy's talking about cutting people's hands off with his blade... The other day, they uh, they raided a house in Queens. Uh, they had a bunch of samurai swords and automatic weapons. Uh, you know, you you walk by a bodega and you, one guy's threatening to beat the shit out of another. You know, I, I can't go. You can't go two blocks in Times Square without somebody trying to sell you some kind of narcotic, which I don't necessarily object to. Uh, you know, I'm a I'm a capitalist, but yeah, I mean, this is really it's Escape from New York. Where is Snake Pliskin? when when you need him um and they were i love it they were t they were talking about on uh, legion of skanks the other day they were talking about the woody allen they were talking about woody allen and he's got all these movies that romanticize the city and they're all located in you know it's like the upper west side that's it that to woody allen and if you watch woody allen movies all of new york is just the fucking upper west side and, and i was thinking about like and they were like yeah like what about fucking brownsville and spanish harlem and all that shit, south bronx and like yeah I was thinking, is this the exact same thing with all these fucking songs? Uh, everyone's moving to New York. They're going to make it in New York. Like, you know, the idiots the idiots who think that uh, the show Girls is real life. Um, you got, you know, obviously the famous one, the OG of New York City songs from the, uh, the chairman of the board, Mr. Frank Sinatra. And if I can rape you there, I'm going to rape you anywhere. It's up to you, New York, New York. I think I just made a joke about non-consensual sex, by the way. I hope someone, do me a favor, don't send this to Gord Miller. He might not like me goofing about people getting raped in, in the city of New York to the tune of Frankie uh, Blue Eyes Sinatra. Who do we got next? Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Wayne Newton. I recall Central Park in fall How I stabbed your chest What a mess I confessed to the uh, detective down at the uh, 44th Precinct. No, I think for the 44th is the Bronx. I think the uh, if you stabbed someone in the chest in Central Park, it would be... Uh, What's that, like 50? That Midtown North? I don't know. Maybe, uh, what about a little, uh, maybe some Petula Clark? Downtown, you will get tased when you're downtown. A crackhead is waiting for you. I mean, these are classics, right? Uh, the smell of shit and piss is in the air on Broadway, on Broadway. And it is. I mean, I used to walk around. Uh, uh, in the summer, when I walk uh, down Broadway to get to work, there are homeless men defecating in pizza boxes, and the street smells like fucking piss. So that is, that would be an accurate rewriting of that song lyric. I mean, we could go through the entire Great American Songbook and just rewrite them and apply the lyrics to shithole New York City in the year 2020. If you got one, if you got a good uh, lyric, give it give it to me in the old comments section. Would love to hear from you. Uh, this part of Brooklyn isn't right, Bruce Lyle, 48, told the Post at the station on Sunday morning. That station has lots of crime. Teenagers, Lord, these are dark days. Wow, you know if... You know if a, like a longtime Brownsville resident is telling you that these are dark days. Things have really, really gone down the shitter. Uh, witnesses describe the chaotic scene, saying the conductor told all strap hangers to get off a train that arrived at the station shortly after the bloodshed. The MTA tweeted around 8 p.m. that trains were bypassing the station due to police activity and offered nearby bus service. I mean, how great is that? That is New York City commuting in a fucking nutshell. Like, oh, wh why are, uh, excuse me, dry, why are we, why are, why do we have to take a bus? I usually, I take the subway. Why is there a shuttle bus? Oh, the station's closed because police are investigating a knife and taser fight between a grown woman and a 14-year-old girl. Yeah, just, just run-of-the-mill stuff in, in New York City. And it's, it, I will give the city credit. 
and this is one of the things that I have always found cool and sort of endearing about the city is that no matter what happens, no matter what a New Yorker sees on the street, they will simply walk around. It's just go around it. Oh, there's there was a, a taser versus uh, versus knife fight on on the subway. Okay, we got to investigate. There's blood. We got to clean up. Uh, we got to tape off the crime scene. Good. Yeah, just get a shuttle bus going. We can't have this shit backed up. Like I feel like if this was uh, you know Milwaukee or wherever the fuck uh, Fort Lauderdale, that would be it. Like they would just they would shut down. You got to walk. Sorry, folks. Um, Everything, you know, fu- fucking cranes fall from uh, construction sites and they hit people in the fucking head, kill them, and it's literally just, all right, guys, we gotta, we're gonna put some caution tape up. Yep, yeah, please use the other side of the street. That's that's what they do in New York. Something happens, someone is dead on one side of 42nd Street. The other side, you're, you're walking up and down, you're popping into the Old Navy, you're, you're going to get some pizza, It's it's all good. Uh, I, you know, fucking pedestrian gets hit by a fucking car. Other side of the street, folks. Someone gets shoved in front of the six train. Shuttle bus upstairs, guys, all right? Hey, you don't want to be late, do you? Uh, he's not, we know he's not making it. You, you want to make it, right? Uh, 9-11. Fucking 9-11. You can go walk. Okay, you're gonna have to go around. We're gonna have a, there's just a big fucking crater in lower Manhattan for, a year after this shit and it's just yeah we got there's business to attend to all right folks hey if you don't if you don't want to get cancer in 20 years from this best walk around the hole don't come near the hole don't breathe this shit in um i'm saying a lot of cancelable stuff right now so if you would like to make me go viral please uh share this with uh deadspin or gawker or well actually i don't know no one gives a fuck who i am so it probably wouldn't make for the best clickbait but i could certainly i could certainly use the traffic but it really all of this shit really does encapsulate my idea of new york city as an arcade game filled with npcs like some you, you go on the subway you go that's the level you're playing right you finish you make it through whatever fucking level you started out with lower manhattan and then you walk down you know the they have the little transition scene between levels you walk down the stairs to the subway station and you know you pass a a homeless guy he's asleep in a pile of his own feces with a needle hanging out of his wrist and uh, like a fucking a thought bubble pops up uh, on the screen and you're just like, wow, this place really is a shithole. Better put my mask on so I don't get hepatitis by breathing too deeply. And then you go down and all of a sudden there's, uh, you know, there are, there's a taser on the ground and a knife on the ground. And there's like a 14 year old uh, girl and a woman and they're walking back and just back and forth on those automatic tracks you gotta fight her you gotta fight the other one and then another one comes and then another one comes and then all of a sudden a homeless guy's walking in and he's shitting in his own hand and firing the turds at you and you have to you have to hold these people off and you have to fight your way to the end of the platform and then a train rolls in and you step onto the train and that's the uh, the end of the next level. You just got to keep hammering that fucking A button to uh, to defeat the knife wielding woman, taser taser wielding child, and feces throwing vagrant. What a city, baby! It is. It really is the city where dreams are made. Dreams of homeless guy basting in their own shit. What do we got next for you? Do oh yes, I fucking uh, oh did I have the wrong? Uh, no, I got the right one. There it is. That I'm sorry. I'm a little uh, like I said, it's been a long day. I hope you can even see that. Uh, hope you can see that graphic up there. Let me. Uh, there we go. Yes. Uh, oh, we do have uh, we have some people. Uh, commenting uh yes gary moyler sings the classics thank you wayside wade wayside wade is just well one of the uh most loyal viewers a podcaster could have thank you for your your loyalty and uh, contributions to uh to my self-esteem wade you're a good 
Good man. Um, are we, uh, is that, are the, uh, everything is updated? Yes, it is. I apologize if you're watching on the, st the stream, if the, uh, I'm pointing in the wrong direction. That way? That, there it is. Um, that, uh, that graphic does not mesh well with my, uh, and I should, it was covering my face a little bit. Sorry about that. I hope, uh, hope I wasn't covering myself all over the goddamn place. We do have this very... <laughs> Very hilarious and important story to tell you guys. I'll bring, uh, bring the old mic a little bit closer. LA teachers warned to not share vacation pics as union seeks safe return to classrooms. Uh, UTLA teachers have been warned not to post vacation pictures on social media as the union continues to seek a safe return to in-person instruction amid the coronavirus pandemic, according to a report Monday. Mm. The teachers were urged to keep spring break pictures off social media because it could hurt the union's argument that it's currently unsafe to return to the classroom, according to a screenshot that appeared to be from a roughly 5,700 member Facebook group titled UTLA Facebook Group Members Only. Um, and here's the, uh, the caption. Friendly reminder, if you are planning any trips for spring break, please keep that off of social media. It's hard to argue that it is unsafe for in-person instruction if parents and the public see vacation photos and international travel, a post from the group read, according to Fox 11 of Los Angeles reporter Bill Melligan. Melligan. That, uh, that's a tough name. You need a better TV name, Bill. Go with Bill Mulligan. That's what I would do. Um... Then again, I'm broadcasting to three people on Facebook and YouTube, so don't don't take my advice. But talk about hiding in fucking plain sight. We can't go back to work, but Cabo is A-OK. -okay. I mean, I think we as a society would be better, it, we'd be in a much better place if we just put all the cards on the table and teachers just laid bare their motives for becoming teachers because there really are two types there are the change the world types who want to make a difference in their students lives but i feel like and i don't think that it's uh false to say this that those are few and far between and becoming fewer and farther between and i feel like you can usually tell who who they are because they are the um I feel like they tend to coach and they tend to teach in the arts departments, right? They do the real passion stuff. They do the things that uh, kids, you know, that there will be a kid who it's, at, it's stuff that's outside of the uh, regular bullshit academic curriculum that the, the, the kid will really grasp and be like, I fucking, uh, I fucking love this. Like I would say, I was going through uh, the, the list um, the other day in my own head just of, of teachers who really i felt cared and made a difference in my life and almost all like obviously i had some great very very nice elementary school um teachers but they're, they're let's be honest they're fucking babysitters um and so you get up to high school and you think about like middle school it was almost zero there's maybe one or two uh high school you get up there and it's more but they were i would say to a t they were all coaches and art teachers um, and then you have the other group, which I feel like is the majority of teachers. They are, as Tim Dillon, uh, coined the phrase vacation enthusiasts. They, they knew the deal. It's a easy fucking job. Like you, you work hard for three years out of the gate and then it's literally like, okay, don't say an ethnic slur in the classroom. Don't bang any of your kids. Do whatever the fuck you want for the next 20. Retire and, and, and collect a, uh, a pension. Um, and now they've had this taste of working from home and not even having to, to go in. For, when you, if your job is, what, what time does school usually start in the morning? Like between 8 and 9 and it wraps up at 3. So you're working, what, 8.30 to 3 in front of your, your fucking computer? And I'm assuming there's a break for lunch because the kids got to eat. Ooh. Oh, that is a cake day. And you get spring break. You get a Christmas break. You get those snow days built in. But since you're not using them because it's fucking COVID, you're getting them off. You get the three-day weekends. You get one probably uh, like every other month or so. You wind up with a three-day weekend. 
and then summer summer vacay. And if you think, I mean, I remember in classroom, you che- everyone's checked out by the first week of May. Like you come back from that April break that you get, that spring break around Easter, and everyone just goes on fucking cruise control to finish out the uh, the year. Um, yeah, I I mean I just love it though. It's it, the 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 world of uh, public education in the United States is just ripe uh, with with entertainment. There, I don't. I was uh, if you. you you see the uh, the graphic on screen again. I I'm not even sure what direction uh, it is to. It is uh, it appears to be up to my uh, my left here. If uh, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken, um, they're putting kids in these like plastic cubes. Like I showed the one a, a couple weeks ago or last week or whatever, where the band nerds were inside of these uh, these green tents. Some fucking jerk offs trying to play the Sousa fo- this oversized uh, brass instrument, and he's stuck inside this stupid fucking thing. I, what, what if you're in the, the fucking violinist inside of one of these things, and he's going like this? I, what the fuck are we doing to these kids? Like we, I am so curious to see what this generation of children grows up to be. I mean, we are just fucking them up like crazy. Like first, at the you know they're elementary school kids, and we're and we're telling them no, you have to stay home for a year because if you go outside and breathe, you could kill grandma. And <laughs> they don't, like they're not they're not you know with it or informed enough to to understand what's going on and that that might be a little bit over the top. Um, so we plant them in front of screens, every just. You know, it used to be they were, you know, looking at their screens in between class, whatever. It was too much already if they were watching YouTube all night when they came home. Now, Zoom all day. Don't go out and play with your friends because you will catch coronavirus and pass it along to grandma and you might die yourself. Um, So stay inside for more screens. There's no physical activity. They're not going outside and beating the shit out of each other. They're not allowed to play smear the queer. You're not even allowed to call your friend a queer anymore. Um, We've just convinced them that everything will hurt them. Everything will kill them. Everything is horrible. And eventually, these people are going to be the next adults who are in charge of making decisions for us. So I'm very curious to see if they just go in the complete opposite direction like off the rails, like you know how they're like, like you know if you, you know the parents that try to force their kid to play sports doesn't he winds up not wanting to play sports? Will the kids whose parents tried to force them to be pussies, will those kids grow up to be just straight up fucking alphas, or will they be this new breed of super pussy that we'd never seen before? Because that's what the the self esteem movement. That started to get popular um, through the uh, you know the 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 eighties and, and into the nineties, and then really took hold in the early two thousands. Uh, that created a, a mass of pussies in this country. So it's curious to see um, what this is going to do here. I think the difference is where the self esteem movement boosted the. Uh, the kids' self-esteem and, and sent them out to engage with the world as these overly confident little shits. This is more like you're denying them all of these things. And what happens when you deny some something to someone? They want it more. So I hope that these kids just grow up craving uh, a, like a sort of aggressive form of freedom, and it just we just turn into a society where people are carrying around AR-15s and doing cocaine and fucking in the streets. Uh, Like a more fun version of Escape from New York, I guess, uh, is is what it is. Oh, maybe de Blasio's onto something. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe I've been uh, coming down down hard on on Mayor uh, Werner Wilhelm or whatever his real name is. And uh, I do love, though, that in some places... Teachers may have to teach summer school this year because they say they've fallen behind so far. The kids aren't getting the, uh, they ain't getting learned the way they're supposed to inside the real classroom. 
So there may be summer school in a lot of places this year, which I'm I'm smugly smiling because it is payback for every bad report card that I ever got and every fucking mid marker that ever that you know that showed up on a Friday and ruined a fucking weekend. Um and got me grounded. Now these cocksuckers get to fucking sit inside and, and think about what they've done. Every detention, all of that, every call home to my parents. Ah, how do you like it? Nah, not so much fun when the shoe's on the other foot, is it, cocksuckers? Uh, you know, if I was, if I was a Batman villain, I would absolutely, one of my fiendish plots would 100% involve giving teachers some sort of indefinite uh like detention or in school suspension like i would create a purgatory where teachers would just be trapped for nine months at a time and we would just bore them to death they would sit there in classrooms at those stupid little stupid little fucking desks where it's just that L-shaped thing and you can't even hide anything good. Like, you can't hide your phone or anything past a fucking note because everything is just too exposed. Uh, you can barely hide your erection when you're looking at the chick's ass in front of you in class. Uh, we just make these... The I, I would My villainous move would just be to uh, to make these these people sit through nine months of that and then release them without explanation for why we had done any of it. Like, they would just be... There would just, there would be, it would be in the newspaper. Like, teachers would be going missing. They'd be like, where are the, what's happening to the teachers? They're disappearing. And then they would cut, and you would see just a bunch of, of teachers losing their fucking minds in just this very bored, terrible classroom. And the only thing that would, the droning at the front of the room would get, like, Ben Stein from Ferris Bueller's Day Off would be the teacher, um... And the only thing that would change throughout the year would be the decorations on the wall for whatever season it was and the weather outside. And you'd have them just looking outside on like a beautiful like September or, or April or May day. And they'd be a, maybe a nice 75 degree day in April when the, uh, the remember the, uh, the, the schools would, they wouldn't turn the fucking heat off until like mid-May because there would always be some stupid thing like, yeah, it's on a schedule. The heat gets turned off May 5th. For, we turn the heat off for Cinco de Mayo. It's not, it's not warm enough to turn the heat off until we're celebrating the Mexicans. Muy caliente. Um, and they would just be sitting there fucking cooking in a classroom and every time you got up to open the window, some annoying chick in the front of the class who has a fucking sweater on would be bitching that she's fucking cold. Um, and that would be it. They'd sit through nine months of that as as punishment for, for what they put us through as uh, as kids. Anyway, I wanted to share that. I do have to, I do have to be hurrying up here and, and get through this because uh, it's 9.45 and I have to make some din-din in time to watch real time with Bill Maher. So let's uh, let's get down to the uh, the final topic of the evening. Where is that uh, that feller? Here it is. I love. Let me tell. By the way, anytime we're doing a royal family story, it's going to be a picture of uh, of, of old Randy Andy up here. Here he is uh, sucking face with some broad. I don't know where they are. But anyway, what uh, royal fundraiser falls flat? A GoFundMe page set up to pay off the mortgage on Meghan Markle and Prince Harry's $14.6 million California estate has gone bust after raising ne a measly $110. This is fucking hilarious to me. A GoFundMe page set up to pay off the mortgage on Meghan Markle and Prince... I, I read that part already. Anastasia Hansen, 56, of California, told Britain's The Sun that she started the fundraising effort because she felt seriously sorry for the multimillionaire royal couple after Harry publicly whined to Oprah Winfrey about being financially cut off by Buckingham Palace. When they came to the USA, they were without jobs and with limited funds, said Hansen, who lives about 25 minutes from the princely pair's palatial estate in swanky Montecito. They've stated that they've had a very rough time, so this fundraiser is a way to give help, compassion, and love 
by paying their home loan in full. Amazing. Imagine thinking that you, for any reason whatsoever, should be hosting a fundraiser for a prince and princess so they can live in a $14.6 million mansion, which, from just the aerial uh, view that the Post provided, I can tell you has a pool, a tennis court, and a playground, and from the article has nine bedrooms and 16 bathrooms. Uh, I mean, Jesus Christ! Even if they lost all their money and were dying of thirst, they could still take a straw to the toilet and, and sustain life for, uh, I guess, as long as uh, the water supply from 16 uh, shitters lasts, which I'm assuming they have pretty big tanks, so probably quite long. And, uh, you know, there's got to be some nutrients in the feces in there. Otherwise, uh, why, are the, why are all those Germans eating it in their porn? Uh, what you say here? Were two million supporters to donate just five dollars each, the goal is met and the loan can be paid off. After their interview, I was moved with compassion to help get their home paid off, as they are now financially independent. This will help and be a loving gift. Yes, Harry and Meghan need the ten million dollars for their fourteen million dollar uh, 16 bathroom mansion, which by the way, there's nine bedrooms and 16 bathrooms. They don't even, everyone, everyone stay, you could have, you could show up to their house with a, uh, a football team and almost everyone could have a bed of their own. And I'm assuming their couches are pretty fucking comfortable. So everyone could sleep comfortably and then everyone could defecate at once, and there would still be bathrooms left over. Uh, this is not a single mother trying to provide for her family and scrape together enough cash to afford a studio apartment in Oceanside, right? It's not the, it's not the guys living under the, uh, the highway overpass in L.A., uh, shooting up dope and uh, living in their own feces. Yeah, they have that in L.A. too. It's not just a New York thing. It's any movie that there was an escape from, uh, uh, <laughs> or any city that there was an escape from movie, uh, consequently <laughs> now has a large population of guys sitting in piles of feces shooting up heroin. Uh, but what, just think of the, the thought process there. Uh, telling people I'm trying to raise... $10 million. It's like, well, that's noble. Who are you raising it for? You know, the homeless, amputated Vietnam veterans? Someone who could use it? No, no, no. A f I'm raising it far more altruistic. A famous actress and one of the princes of England didn't want to live in their castle in England anymore, so they bought a mansion in California, but it's really expensive and it could be tough for them to afford, so I started to go fund me. I mean, just... One of the dumbest things ever done. Like, even though it was ostensibly done in the name of charity, it is it's re remains one of the most preposterous acts I have ever heard of. And the thing is, it's not real charity, right? No one could actually look at this and say that this is real charity. Like, this bitch clearly want, just wanted the accolades, right? This was She was attempting to virtue signal and big time big time swing and a miss but she did like if you look at the uh the statement she used the right words you know help compassion and love unfortunately uh she applied them to the royal couple which again consists of uh a prince and a uh a, f a former or i guess i'm assuming she go back to acting a uh, hollywood uh, actress and they are living in a mansion, and oh, by the way, it's 2021, and everybody fucking hates rich people. So it's she basically she Michael Scotted her GoFundMe uh, attempt. This is how Michael Scott would do it. He would see the Oprah interview. He'd he'd be like, oh no, the prince and princess need somewhere to live. They're they're gonna get their mansion taken away, and he would start a, a GoFundMe, or he would host a, a fund run or a charity auction. Or, uh, or something. Like, I don't know what, you know, what his, his angle would be. Like, he would be, you know, he'd try to sell the ladies of Dunder Mifflin, uh, calendar 
and he would just it would just be twelve pictures of of Meredith showing off their tits and or eleven and one of Pam covering up uh, her face, and uh, he would be he would be furious. He would be furious with everybody in the office as they tried to explain to him that the prince had reportedly inherited around $13 million from his late mother, Princess Diana, and that the couple reportedly has an estimated $100 million production deal with Netflix and are said to be taking in $1 million apiece every time they give uh, a speech. Yes. So you see... They might not need the 110 buckaroos from this buffoon's uh, GoFundMe. Hansen's online bid to try to financially help the royals was started a few days ago and shut down by Saturday after just three donations, the Sun said. Hansen kicked in $5 while a supporter gave 100 and Anonymous bestowed 5 bucks on the fund. The page had read, I am Anastasia Hansen of Ventura, California, and I am raising funds to pay off the mortgage for the Montecito, California home of Harry and Meghan. Yeah, so you can see she's leading with her name, uh, which smacks of desperation for attention, right? She could have done it anonymously. That, you know, it appears that uh, 105 of the $110 given were indeed given anonymously. And I, you know, it's... You can hear in in that phrase um, that she is envisioning being brought, you know, on the Today Show. You know, maybe she'll be on the couch on Ellen. Maybe maybe she'll get to meet the royal couple, right? They'll bring her out on Ellen, and Ellen will be talking to her, and she'll be like, well, what's her name? Well, Anastasia, you surprised the royal couple by paying off their mortgage We've got a surprise for you. Harry and Meghan, come on out. And everyone would would clap and people would forget that Ellen is reportedly a cunt behind closed doors. Um, and she'd sit on the, the couch with the, uh, the prince and princess and they'd be friends and it'd be great. And maybe she'd do Kimmel, maybe Fallon. Uh, you have to think that if she really wanted to help, she would have kicked in more than five bucks, right? Like you thought it was important enough to raise $2 million or $10 million, right? You thought 2 million people would think it was that important, which you could, I don't even think you get that for, a, 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 a fucking, a kid could have, uh, could have cancer. His, you could make a, an impassioned plea on video with the family crying, they can't afford his fucking cancer treatment and they're not getting, they're not getting that many donations. Um, you know, no one's, no one gives enough of a fuck about the Royals. Like, I don't give, I, fuck, no one gives a shit about these jerk-offs. Um, particularly, and this is as we wrap up, I just wanted to throw it out there, uh, our girl, uh, Marjorie Taylor Green. As you know, we are Marjorie Taylor Green stands here at the Savage Sack Tap. We do very badly want to spend a night of romance with her. Uh, Georgia Republican Rep Marjorie Taylor Greene declared, Nobody cares about the stupid royals and called D.C. a shithole in a venting session with ex-president Donald Trump's former strategist, Steve Bannon. Green called Prince Harry and wife Meghan Markle's complaint-filled weekend Oprah interview a distraction from President Biden's legislative agenda, including the just-signed $1.9 trillion COVID-19 stimulus bill, that conservatives call wasteful. The news, our conservative media has got to do better. They're sitting here talking about the royals. Nobody cares about the stupid royals. What we need to look at is the consequences of these deals, Green told Bannon on his war, on his war Room podcast. And again, like I said with uh, Trump, you know, it's not about whether you like her or whether you like him or whether you hate him. It's it's Marjorie Taylor Greene. You can love her. You can hate her. You can want to take a blue chew and sip margaritas by the pool on a, a sunny weekend afternoon before heading up to a, to a nice air-conditioned hotel room and, and bathing each other in aloe before a nice roll on the freshly turned-down sheets. Uh, 
Uh, but she is not wrong about this. Uh, even if you are politically opposed to Marjorie Taylor Greene, I think we can all agree that this Royals stuff is just absolute bullshit. I mean, again, we should differentiate. The asinine behavior surrounding it is hilarious. The Epstein stuff, serious, should get to the bottom of it, also, in some ways, objectively hilarious. Whether a bunch of rich people are having a fight in their mansion is not something we should give a shit about. Um, it's probably a fucking smokescreen. These people aren't stupid. They've been doing this for centuries. Uh, it, you know, if we fight publicly, they'll forget all about the fact that Randy Andy was definitely probably diddling teenagers down on Pedophile Island. Um, you know, wag the dog, as it were. I, that's, I believe that's the saying, right? Wag the dog. You're, you are purposely putting controversy out there to distract us from the, the real travesty, which again is the billionaire pedo ring. And it seems not so trend, it seems very transparent that the mainstream media is driving the narrative that the big story out of, of Westminster is this uh, this row between uh, Harry, Meghan, and uh, the, the Queen and, and company, and that, uh, well, I don't know, and uh, pedophile island, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't do that, I don't, uh, I don't travel to, uh, to Ireland, and I don't sweat, and I don't eat pizza, whatever the fuck. Um, yeah, no, a, a hot chick fighting with her in-laws is not of, of national importance. That's what we'll leave on today. We will leave on that, and we will leave on um, a stern, stern reminder that you all, where is that, uh, where is that silly little thing? Let me, let me find it. Just a moment. Yes, that you bastards, click the subscribe button. Click the subscribe, the like, the follow, the share. Do it all. Do it here at facebook.com slash the savage crew. YouTube, Mike Montone, Instagram at Gary underscore Moiler, M O Y L E R, Twitter at Mike Montone, the website is meatheadmedia.com. That's where you can get all your Mike Montone. Oh, baby, my blogs, my links, everything. Go check it out. And if you're, uh, Again, if you're if you're a listener, if you're a watcher, uh, blow up the DMs. Give me a shout. Uh, let me know if let me know if there's a topic you'd like to hear covered. Uh, let me know. Do you think there's something I should shut the fuck up about? I probably won't listen to you, but I might. Uh, just do it to say hi. You know, we'll make out. We'll trade pics of each other playing with our genitals. It'll be fun. Um, it'll be romantic. But I am going to go. I have two minutes until Bill Maher starts. I'm going to watch while I cook dinner. Doing some crab meat over angel hair pasta. Going to replenish those carbs. Get a whole bunch of protein in. Had a good workout today. Fucking, what did I deadlift? Uh, 365. Hit it for a, a, a crisp seven reps. It was nice. Um, and that's that. Catch you guys later. Bye.